So most of you here have heard of archaeology, and you have some idea of what archaeologists do. So when you think of archaeology, this is probably close to what you picture. So this is me on our excavation in Egypt. So behind me, you can see people excavating through the tomb. So archaeologists reconstruct the past societies <clears throat> and the lives of the people by using the culture, uh, by using these the things that these cultures have left behind. So these things can include pottery, stone tools, metal technologies, buildings, and roads. So this is what most archaeologists study. So I'm actually a bioarchaeologist.、Uh, you've probably never met one of us. There aren't very many of us in the world. But what that means is that I'm an archaeological specialist. Instead of studying the things left behind by previous people, I study the people themselves. So I excavate and analyze human skeletons. So currently, I have two excavations: one in Egypt and one in Mongolia. So I reconstruct the lives of ancient populations based on evidence left behind by the actual bones and teeth. So one of my research interests is <clears throat> the formation of identity. So how we can reconstruct individual and population identity from the archaeological record. So I will be talking about my issues with my own identity and how this led me to choose bioarchaeology as my profession, and also how being a bioarchaeologist gave me specific insights into understanding and finally accepting my own ancestral history. So my parents emigrated from Taiwan to the United States to go to graduate school. So I was actually born in Texas. So my childhood was a fairly confusing and lonely period. At home, my parents expected me to act like I was Taiwanese, even though I had no idea what that meant. And at school, I was expected to be American. So at home, I was expected to obey my parents and never to ask any questions. At school, I was expected to ask questions and was actually called stupid for staying quiet. Whoops. <clears throat> so once in class, we had to draw our family tree. I drew my family with my grandfather and his three wives. <laughs> The teacher told me I must be wrong. She said my grandfather had to have married each wife after the previous one had died. I said no. He had them at the same time. <laughs> and it was common in many Asian countries before World War II for wealthy men to have as many wives as they could afford. The teacher actually accused me of lying and sent me to the principal's office. So this is a picture of my grandmother visiting us in Texas. So the third wife. So as a child, I was always fascinated by bones. So whenever we had fried chicken or Thanksgiving turkey, I would ask my parents to identify the bones for me before I would actually eat. And then I would take the carcass and reassemble the bones in anatomical order. My parents encouraged this behavior because they were hopeful I would become a medical doctor. <laughs> to their very great disappointment, I chose anthropology. Going away to an、uh, not anniversary, going away to university was the first time I actually met students who were very knowledgeable and proud of their ethnic identity. So this actually inspired me to learn more about my own ancestral history. <clears throat> so at that time, there were very few foreign archaeologists working in East Asia, and I wrote to all five of them. So five American archaeology professors who did work in China, and I asked them how I could get to China to work on their ancient skeletons. Four of them told me the Chinese would never let a foreigner work on their skeletons, and that I should give up. The last professor was the one at Harvard. Most of the American archaeologists who still work in China today are either his students or his students' students. He actually told me not to give up. He believed that if I was persistent but polite, that one day the Chinese would give me the chance, and he was right. So that particular letter I've still kept to this day. So working in East Asia was a huge culture shock for me. First of all, everyone around me all of a sudden was Asian, 
And I actually couldn't tell people's faces apart because I had never been around that many Asians before. <laughs> I had the opportunity to work on several archaeological excavations all over China and neighboring Mongolia. Many times I was the only foreigner and sometimes the only woman on these excavations. <clears throat> on my first excavation in Mongolia, a Mongolian graduate student told me that women didn't belong on archaeological excavations, that I should be at home caring for a family. So I have researched thousands of human skeletons spanning over 5,000 years, and I had actually expected, since my ancestors came from China, that I would look like these skeletons that I was studying, but actually I didn't. I also didn't look like any of the Chinese that were living in most of China. What was even more surprising was that while I was on excavation in Mongolia, the Mongolians actually thought I was Mongolian. So this was quite ironic. Uh, so most of you know what the Great Wall is. The Great Wall was built by the Chinese to separate their civilized part from the crazy barbaric Mongolians north of the wall. So uh, I looked not like the people I was supposed to look like south of the wall, but like the barbarians north of the wall. So this made me realize that maybe my family's history was a lot more complicated than being just Taiwanese. So while working in Beijing, I was given the opportunity to go on an archaeological excavation near my father's family's ancestral village in far northwestern China. No one from my family had been there in over 600 years. So my boss warned me that the Chinese archaeologists in Gansu province were not going to be very civilized, like the ones in cosmopolitan Beijing. He said they were going to be pretty wild. So I told him, you know, I'm from Texas. <laughs> and he said, oh yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> so Gansu province has always been sort of a frontier region in China. It's where the Silk Road actually exits China on its way to the west. It's also the region where Chinese, Tibetan, Mongolian, and Uyghur people have lived together for thousands of years. So the archaeologists there were pretty wild. Uh, we took a nine-hour crazy road trip through the mountains, and uh, once we reached the archaeological site, I was really shocked at how beautiful it was. The river running through the site was so clear that it actually reflected the vegetation off the mountains so that the river was actually a beautiful shade of pale green. I asked how far my ancestral village was, and they said, it's just one valley over. And I asked if it was just as beautiful as this valley. They said, no, it's a piece of crap. <laughs> That's probably why your ancestors left. <clears throat> so, the archaeologists just like to play a game with me if they know I'm around. It's called, What's My Dynasty? So, essentially what that means is, uh, in any geographical region, there's sort of an average face over time. So, the average face lasts a couple of hundred years. So, they like to ask, um, most of them ask me what dynasty their face is, since I work with skulls. The interesting thing was, after analyzing the skulls from this archaeological site, I actually called up my dad since it's his family's ancestral region. And I actually was able to tell my dad that he still, the, the face that he has is the same face that's been in this region for the past 3,000 years. So, my dad's a geneticist, and so as a Christmas present one year, we all had our genetic test done. <clears throat> What we found out was that my maternal and paternal grandmothers both had Taiwanese indigenous tribal DNA. So these indigenous people are uh, related to Polynesians, actually, and they were the people there before the Chinese and Japanese colonized Taiwan. They are actually also traditionally headhunters until the early 1930s, so I find that ironic that I travel the world still collecting skulls. So for a long time, anyone Taiwanese who knew they had family members who were partially tribal or fully tribal would have been ashamed to mention it. It's only been in the last few years that this viewpoint has changed and that people are now proud to claim this heritage. So now there are actually several movements around Taiwan to preserve these cultures. 
Um, when I visited Taiwan for a family reunion with my parents, um, they were nice enough to take me to one of these traditional tribal villages. So this is what you see. It's actually the Paiwan tribal village, which is within three kilometers of my dad's childhood home. So while we were there, <clears throat> I asked my dad, are there any historical documents about our family? Because I wanted to see if there was historical proof that our family had multiple ethnicities instead of only being ethnically Chinese. So while I was there, my uncle was nice enough to send me what is called the family name book. So a name book lists all of the sons that are born to that family. And most of these name books are fairly accurate up to the last 600 years. Um, then they also will list the probable oldest ancestor. So, you know, people always dream about being descended from somebody great and powerful and awesome. <clears throat> so, my family is descended from a minor royal prince. He was the 20th out of 22 sons. And he was significant enough that there are historical records about him. So, he was famous in his time for being a well-known drunk and womanizer. <clears throat> That's what I can aspire to. <laughs> so actually, what struck me as most important about this book, and many Chinese families have this book, there are thousands that have still survived, is what is actually missing from this book. So all of the wives, mothers, and daughters are missing. And through my own genetic and historical textual research, it is these missing family women that contribute to the multiple non-ethnic Chinese ethnicities in my family narrative. So, I just started a new job in bioarchaeology at Cal State University in Los Angeles, and I needed a new archaeological excavation in order to take graduate students. So I emailed all of my colleagues who were still working in China and Mongolia and asked if any of them needed a bioarchaeologist and was starting a new excavation where I could bring students with me. So guess which Mongolian archaeologist said yes? The one who told me 10 years earlier that women should never be on an excavation. <clears throat> so I went the first year, and it was me and 23 Mongolian men. Yeah. So I was worried that um, being foreign was going to be difficult, and actually the hardest thing was simply being a woman. So the reason I was invited to go on excavation at the cemetery is that the skeletons they had come up with so far did not match any of the skeletons that had been already excavated in Mongolia. So in Mongolia, there are two missing dynasties. What this means are, is that these dynasties have been written about, so historical accounts from different countries, diplomatic letters, wars, treaties, trade, but there's no physical evidence of these two dynasties. So no one has found their cities, no one has found their cemeteries. One of the reasons is that these two dynasties are from the Dark Ages of East Asian history, so no one really knows who these people were and why they disappeared. So when I got there, the Mongolian students had already played What's My Dynasty and had compared the skulls from the cemetery to their own, and it didn't match any of them. Luckily, the skulls did match um, ones in China from an ethnicity called the Shenbei. And the Shenbei is the first of those two missing dynasties. So by then, we knew we had found the first one. So do you remember my drunk ancestor? His mother and grandmother were Shenbei. So, every year, we still have some new discoveries, and I will be returning to Mongolia in two weeks for the third year of our, of our excavation. So, this year, I've actually been invited to look at a second cemetery in Mongolia, because they are thinking that this is the second missing dynasty. So I'm pretty excited about that. So what I hope for you all to take away from my long and torturous journey is to question your own identity. So try to look at it from the outside. Don't take for granted what people tell you you are. Truly ask the questions and find out if it's actually true. 
and if it's actually even just true for you. So every person in this room is unique. There has never been anyone exactly like you, and there never will be. So take an active part in how you construct and pre present your own unique, unique sorry, reality. Thank you.